next uh, panel uh, or session uh, emerging presence of the new actors in the Middle East. And we designate as a chair, Professor uh, Davut Kiani, uh, to run this panel. Uh, Professor Kiani, you have the floor to conduct uh, this special panel and to keep the time in order to be yeah, to have also a small break, at least. Thank you very much, Professor Kiani. Thank you all. Uh, I hope we have a very passionate discussion in this panel because the title is very hot and uh, very important. And, uh, and thank you all the organizers. I am very honored to moderate this very important uh, panel. Uh, since um, we don't have uh, very much time and there are a number of panelists in this session, without any hesitation, so I would like to go to the all the speakers one by one to get their points regarding the subjects of the panel, which is emerging presence of the new actors in the Middle East. Of course, we know that the uh, Middle East countries are uh, little by little taking more closer to the Asian power. Their orientation is toward Asian powers and Asian powers and most presumably China uh, is uh, step by step getting closer to the Middle East. Uh, there are lots of questions about their role, the possible role of the China and its strategic uh, projects uh, in the Middle East. Uh, how could it be? And uh, we have in this panel uh, two keynote speakers. Uh, before we go through the panel, I'd like to ask all the speakers to be so punctual to the time. Um, each between eight to 10 minutes, not to let the session be boring because we are in the afternoon, it's the third session. And uh, in this time, I asked His Excellency, Dr. Jafar Kushari, if you hear me, please uh, go ahead and take the lead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kani. Excellencies, uh, esteemed scholars and intellectual, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, salam alaikum and good afternoon. Allow me at the outset to extend my sincere appreciation to MEPI and uh, Euro Defend Romania for arranging this webinar in partnership with the Institute for Political and National Studies, IPIS Tehran, and for bringing such an interesting issue uh, to our attention. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the president of MEPI, Dr. Flavius Taba Maria, for extending, uh, extending the kind invitation. <clears throat> I am uh, indeed humbled to be given the opportunity to speak among such a scholarly crowd with men of such knowledge and devotion the organization I'm heading, the D8 Organization for Economic Cooperation, is a transnational intergovernmental organization founded in 1997 by eight developing countries where three members are from MENA region, uh, namely Egypt, Iran, and Turkey. Uh, a little bit about the organization. This organization aims at increasing economic cooperation among the member states in order to boost economic growth and ensure sustainable development. Currently, the eight commands a combined GDP of about 4 trillion US dollars with a total population of 1.16 billion. The eight is a prominent economy organization that accounts for almost 5% of the global GDP, as well as 5% of the total trade volumes of the whole world. As I Going, I'm going to address this issue. First, uh, my point of view would be very much related to economic uh, development. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Middle East geographical and strategic uniqueness has made every great power in history seeks to advance its interests 
in the region, especially in the age of oil. In addition, the region is the birthplace and spiritual center of the world's three most important monotheistic religions. Due to its geography, geopolitical importance, any inter and intrastate conflict in the Middle East has the potential not only for destabilizing the region as a whole or upsetting the regional balance of power, but also affecting global stability. If I say something about the emerging presence of the new actors in this region, I have to start with the fact that the last few years have witnessed a paradigm shift in US foreign policy. The United States has increasingly disengaged from direct involvement in the Middle East. Despite Trump's withdrawal from the Iranian nuclear deal, his passive approach to Middle East conflicts was perhaps surprisingly aligned with this Obama policy of increased disengagement. Washington has significantly reduced the number of US troops in Iraq, and US President Joe Biden has pledged to focus on only a small number of objectives in the region. Instead of playing a direct role in shaping regional politics, the US is moving towards a more indirect role in approaching Middle East conflicts. As this retrenchment has proceeded, it has provided opportunities for other powerful outside actors, including Russia and China, to increase their presence in the region and position themselves as alternative partners and patrons. China's economic relationship with the Middle East is not limited to energy. The country is also expanding its ties and influence through its Belt and Road Initiative. China is now the region's largest investor and the largest trading partner to 11 Middle Eastern countries. It has financed the constructions of ports and industrial parks in Egypt, Oman, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Djibouti, where Beijing maintains its sole overseas military base. The regional conflicts that began through Arab Spring in 2011 in this region has drawn many external actors, Russia, as well as the US and its allies, and provoked extra territorial move from regional states, most notably Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. But none of these past decades conflicts have reached a formal resolution, with the possible exceptions of Libya. The suffering in Syria and Yemen is far from over as with conflicts, so with causes. The power of the Palestinian issue in particular to shape the region has been further reduced. The latest round of fighting in Gaza between Hamas and Israel resulted neither in any renewed diplomatic initiative nor in an increase of support for Hamas and the Palestinians. In Lebanon, political and economic crisis have not drawn in other actors from outside the region so far, though it has always been an arena of rivalry among regional powers in the Middle East. The conflict in Yemen has been deprioritized for the UAE and Saudi Arabia. The old causes that once dominated foreign policy and shaped the agenda of the region have been sidelined. Solidarity based on Arabs or Islamic identity has been superseded by alliances based on mutual interest, spurred on by the need to prioritize economic growth and a growing realization that shared security concerns are best addressed collectively. A new pragmatic policy vision is emerging in the Middle East, where the fresh emphasis on economic growth and pragmatic approach to geopolitical tensions are both welcome. It is striking, for example, that the UAE has concluded treaties with Israel and India at a time when both states have been hostile towards their indigenous Arabs and Muslim populations. Several Arab state, states have continued to develop close commercial and defend relationship with China despite Uyghur issue. 
solidarity on ethnic or religious ground is weighed against other considerations. The past years have seen a flurry of diplomatic activity in the region aimed at the escalations of political rivalries. But the visions that dominate the region in recent years are now economic rather than political. The UAE has explicitly aligned its foreign policy to its economic interests, reduced its projection into regional conflicts and reach out to regional rival Turkey. In its most recent and highest profile, the escalatory move Foreign Minister Abdullah bin Zayed has been posted in Damascus by President Bashar al-Assad of Syria. Saudi Arabia, meanwhile, is vigorously pursuing its transformational agenda through economic partnerships and the cuttings of foreign investors. In the Levant, Jordan has led a tentative rapprochement with the heavily sanctioned Assad regime. And while there is no material progress on the Iran-Saudi Arabia file, both sides have made contact in Baghdad and so far avoided escalation. Egypt, meanwhile, has reached out to Turkey in a tentative rapprochement over Libya and the Eastern Mediterranean. Several factors underlie this shift in climate. There are, of course, hard-nosed security considerations against conventional threats, but there are also economic drivers. Governments are under pressure to deliver a recovery from COVID-19, which is forcing a prioritization of the economy. For the Gulf states, there is the strong additional driver to achieve the economic targets set in their ambitious transformational visions. These programs are becoming more urgent as the global transition from the hydrocarbons gathers momentum, most recently spurred on by COP26. Unsurprisingly, new economic rivalries are already starting to emerge. Regional competition for global business, talent and investment will be intense as states try to achieve transformational economic targets. There are clear signs that the UAE and Saudi Arabia, the two states with the highest level of ambition and the highest vulnerability to transition from hydrocarbon, find themselves entering a more rivalrous dynamic. In the long term, these rivalries are more likely to drive economic growth than to damage it. They will be part of a wider reconfiguration of the regional economy as well the expansions of its sphere of influence to include economic and security partners in the Eastern Mediterranean, such as Greece and Israel, and in Asia, such as Pakistan, India, and China. Ladies and gentlemen, while this expansion will introduce new variables into the economy, it is clear that the most immediate beneficiaries will be the strong economies of the Gulf. Such, as initiative, uh, such an initiative suggests the need for regional structures for investment and infrastructure, as well as skills to spread the benefits and to build resilience against future shocks, ranging from public health to oil prices. It may also extend to considering, in light of the new pragmatism and the rapidly evolving geopolitical landscape of the region, what approach the Middle East should and could now take to collective security. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I forgot, uh, I have, sorry, I forgot to introduce His Excellency, uh, Dr. Uh, Javar Kushari, Secretary General Development and Organization for Economic Cooperation, the Eight Malaysia. Thank you for uh, your amazing remarks. Uh, we, without any hesitation, directly move to Excellency Mr. <coughs> Viorel Istosio uh, Budura. Sorry for miss. Uh, if I made a mistake in pronouncing his, his name, 
uh, floor is yours, please. Thank you, uh, Dean Chair. Don't worry about the uh, pronunciation of my name. Um, distinguished participants, uh, I, I feel very privileged to join you today for a debate focused uh, on a region which uh, enjoys uh, either in inverted commas or not a specific dynamic and which historically, traditionally, not only on the map, has been so close to my country. As a diplomat, uh, I spent more than half of my career uh, in East Asian countries. And today I would like to share with you uh, some of my observations and a few opinions, mostly as a practitioner in the field of international relations, less as a theorician or a scholar. Um, in respect to the involvement of major Asian countries in the uh, Middle East region, uh, I'm sure, uh, and I was listening to the morning session with great admiration for the uh, very insightful opinions expressed in, and incidentally, uh, you may have heard already how major Asian powers and countries have direct interest in the Middle East region. Um, if I may recall, some observers already noticed uh, that over the past century, uh, it has been almost a sort of a natural law uh, that the great and middle powers rising uh, all, almost invariably look at the Middle East and North Africa region. And uh, of course, the reasons is history, geography, the economy, you name it. And we live now through a century which also goes through various transformations under the pressure of uh, specific characteristics, interdependence, interconnectivity, globalization, and many other things you may notice and name as influencing the developments in MENA and in East Asia. However, the strategic, strategic implications are less clear and speaking about the involvement of the uh, great Asian countries in MENA region, I think we, we inevitably will notice that general global trends have an impact. Of course, already a few distinguished uh, speakers have mentioned the growing uh, United States-China competition. I would prefer this kind of a more benign, more diplomatic etiquette, a label which uh, may be defined in many ways. Uh, the impact of COVID pandemics, we know it, and the challenges brought uh, forward by the fourth technological and industrial revolution. These trends may suggest that uh, the countries from East Asia may have a more direct and substantial interest in getting involved in MENA region, in the Middle East. Of course, currently, many have noticed already in their previous remarks, the fact that Middle East, uh, with its regional structure, its security agenda, may limit involvement of external powers and participation of certain regional countries and non-state actors, because still the United States, in spite of the trends already named and visible, it's still the sole dominant country in the structure, existing structure, and the most influential one. But at the same time, as also noticed already, China, India in particular, uh, are at the forefront of this astonishing rise of new powers. Their GDP has grown tremendously in the last decade. Then we can foresee that uh, followed in a certain extent accompanied more correctly by many other strong economies like Japan, Republic of Korea, Singapore, and many other countries from uh, the Far East, they may more visibly be involved in the developments in Middle East. Of course, uh, that was not very much developed in the remarks by uh, the distinguished speakers, but uh, to a certain extent, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, had the effect of accelerating these global trends, uh, cementing the rise of Asia uh, as a sort of epicenter of this century, the 21st century, especially because uh, the most important dynamic, political and security dynamic, this competition 
between United States and China will be visible over there, first and foremost, not only, not limited to that area, but that's the place where the theater of this new power game uh, may be more visible for everyone. Um, of course, if you look from the Middle East towards this, Asian, East Asian actors, you, you may uh, question why uh, they are interesting for the Middle East countries and why the Middle East countries may welcome their interest. Of course, their energy needs uh, of the Eastern East Asia uh, countries for Middle East as a supplier of energy, gas, oil, and in many other ways might justify yeah, these connections. But at the same time, uh, the countries I have mentioned, starting with China, Republic of Korea, Japan, Singapore, um, India, uh, all of them have enjoyed a certain domestic political stability, in spite of the fact that their political systems may be defined with various characteristics uh, imprinted by uh, national, historical, traditional uh, elements. At the same time, uh, most of them have a story of being successful uh, modern economies. You may remember the uh, Asian tigers or rising Asian dragons, yeah? Singapore, Taiwan, um, Japan, of course, recovering after the Second World War. All of them are success stories in terms of the economy as trade partners. Then that's motivating and justifying uh, their effort in joining and linking themselves better to the Middle East. At the same time, uh, many of them, and again, China might be an obvious example, but not the only one, uh, are okay, Republic of uh, Korea, Japan, uh, are at the front for, uh, forefront of the technological revolution. And that might be another dimension, as you know all very well, of the competition between the United States and China. And mentioning United States, all of these countries develop a certain quite specific type of relationship with the United States. Of course, are okay, Japan being allies, uh, India with recent developments closer to the United States in many ways, and also, very much uh, having to pay attention to the way in which the developments in the policy of the United States addressing the Middle East region may also uh, shape or adjust the relationship with uh, Washington. And that's very visible in the fact that besides what uh, the so-called quad format, the four countries, United States, India, uh, Japan, Australia in, uh, in the Far East have established, starting as a sort of uh, consultation formatted coordination in respect of many sides of the policies from foreign affairs to defense, has appeared in a sort of a Middle East version recently, uh, also again, under the lead, if I may, of the United States with India being uh, a new partner and joining that with Israel and the Emirates, um, a link between four capitals, which of course, for the time being, may just present an agenda in a rather, with inverted commas, benign way, uh, focused on economy and other issues of common interest, but which may also get stabilized in the future as a format which may gain new virtues in terms of addressing issues in the region. China was mentioned in, in many ways. And uh, of course, uh, I would kindly draw your attention given the economy of time uh, available for me uh, to two aspects, Belt and Road. And you know how much uh, already um, the comprehensive partnerships which China has established with a number of countries in the Middle East has also been supported by developments of trade technological and industrial agenda, but at the same time, the most uh, important major in scale, value, and possible future impact has been this uh, project of the Belt and Road Initiative, which keeps unfolding. 
Of course, it has a certain scale. It has a certain strategic meaning that should be, and I'm sure many uh, in approaching in next uh, session, the uh, presence of China in Middle East may uh, address more in details the meaning of this uh, major project and the way in which either US or with its uh, in G7 framework uh, uh, build back better uh, initiative or the European Union with what was mentioned, the most recent uh, global gateway project are trying to meet the challenge of the Belt and Road in the strategic sense. And the second point I'd like to make, it's about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which by the participation in, in the recent, in this year, of major players from the Middle East, including Iran, including Turkey, has shown strong interest and willingness to play a certain role in stabilizing the region, developing a multi-dimensional cooperation agenda. And since, we just discussed Afghanistan in the previous session. That might be something very meaningful for the region and might be a framework which would allow a greater deal of cooperation, of convergence and views, overcoming certain disputes and sensitive approaches and giving a chance for supporting the stability and economic development of uh, Afghanistan. Um, about Japan, um, everybody knows uh, with the miracle it performed in the 60s and 70s after recovering, yeah, after the, the World War II, uh, it's now a highly uh, networked uh, middle power. Uh, its economy is still among the, the strongest in the world, together with US, uh, China, India rising, and still may have a number of areas in which it offers to the Middle East countries a uh, very relevant potential for cooperation, either in digital transformation, technological competition, uh, in addressing the environment concerns, uh, future energy types of uh, technologies. Then uh, Japan, in spite of facing certain domestic challenges, aging population, decline of population, demographic decline, et cetera, it still remains one of the uh, economic trade and political actor, either in, in uh, East Asia or in general in the world, which uh, was uh, paying attention and welcoming its um, implication in the Middle East. Since 2012, um, since the then uh, Abe administration, Abe prime minister, um, it developed a number of political con contacts, high level political contacts in, in, in the Middle East and succeeded uh, to work on issues which were relevant for, for the region. India, as I mentioned, and that was mentioned already by a number of distinguished speakers, it's showing greater interest, in many ways plays an important economic role and a role which it's uh, either offering us the chance to uh, noticed a sort of a division of labor which has emerged between the Asian players in the Middle East or understand better how it's an evolving type of international uh, division of labor. Traditionally, it was visible that Japan will come with technology, with uh, industries in which has enjoyed uh, certain potential and advantages. Uh, China now with a lot of investments in um, public projects, utilities, has been mentioned. Sorry, ports, Mr. Ambassador, network. one or yes. two minutes, please. Thank you, very kind. And uh, as I was saying, India emerging as an investor, a more uh, with a more serious profile, and are okay also with a number of uh, technologies. Then um, I will just finish by inviting greater attention to the new macroeconomic policies decided in Beijing, which, uh, quite possibly in the coming decades, will invite a new division of labor in Asia in connection with the Middle East economic and trade developments, and of course, at the global scale. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for this 
comprehensive pictures that you presented about the China and Asian powers and Middle East. Uh, Mr. Budra was a former ambassador of Romania to the to Peop uh, People's Republic of China and also former head of the European Union delegation to Japan, managing director, head of the Asian Pacific Department, European External Action Service. Thank you a lot. We go uh, to uh, Dr. Yao Jingxiang, Assistant Research Fellow, Department for Developing Country Studies, CIIS. Thank you. Please go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Jingxiang, do you hear me? Are you there? Can you hear my voice? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 please. Okay, okay. Yes, okay. yes, please okay. go ahead. Okay, okay. It's 8 p.m. in China and uh, good night, everyone. Uh, the title of this uh, session is New Actors uh, Such as China, Japan, and Korea. But I have to say, uh, these three countries are not so new in, in this region because we have connections with Middle East nearly. 2000 years ago, such as uh, Silk Road or the Belt and Road Initiative, and much longer before than the United States or some Western countries. So I think China and Japan not so new in this region. And uh, okay, so let's my, uh, let's my speech in this, in this part. Uh, I'm in China Institute of International Studies, but my academic background is in Japan diplomacy and my PhD is also in Japan. So I can understand very well that uh, uh, these Asian countries such as China, Japan, South Korea, or India are so interested in the Middle East. So what does this mean for the Middle East? Uh, I believe that after the COVID-19 and there will be a trend of multi uh, polarization in the Middle East. And uh, we can understand this multi polarization in two aspects. One is a multi-polarization within Middle East countries, such as Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Israel. And the other uh, aspect of multi-polarization is these new actors, such as China, Japan, India, and so on. And we can say these new actors are behave more and more active in the Middle East. And uh, we know that from the theory of international relations, that multi-polarization often leads to, lead to instability, alliance, or competition. Therefore, in my opinion, it is very difficult to, to expect China, Japan, India, and South Korea can cooperate in the Middle East. They may compete fiercely in the, in the third party markets in Middle East to expand their business interest just as they did in Southeast Asia, Oceania, and uh, Africa. Why am I so pessimistic about the cooperation in Middle East? The main reason is that although the United States retreats from the Middle East, but it still has a huge influence in this region, and most of these new actors are alliance or partners of United States. So these countries will not go too close to China, and they are unwilling to say China's influence in this region are growing. And they even have a skeptical attitude towards China's Belt and Road Initiative in the Middle East. And I also have some personal experiences about this. Uh, nearly two years ago, when the relationship between US and uh, Iran was very dangerous, uh, Japan actively wanted to act as a bridge between United States and Iran, and uh, Japan Prime Minister Abe also visited Iran in 2019. At that time, I wrote a short article to a Japanese think tank and emphasizing that uh, China and Japan have same position and interest in this region and can cooperate together to promote the US-Iran negotiations. I think it is a good suggestion, uh, but the Japanese think tank rejected my article. And they said that 
it is impossible for Japan uh, to co cooperate with China in the uh, in Iran in the context of of Japan U.S. alliance. I feel so frustrated at that time ab about this, and I also realized that many countries, especially U.S. alliance, uh, have difficult have difficulty in developing relations uh, uh, with Ch with China independently, and uh, they must care about Americans' opinions and uh, interest. Uh, therefore, I think we will see more competition in the Middle East in the future, uh, especially among these new actors. Uh, this may be good news for the Middle East because they will have more choices and they can choose a better one. But this may also uh, lead to very fierce competition, endless chaos, and uh, inefficient cooperation. Therefore, I hope that two frameworks should be established among these new actors in Middle East. One is a, a, one is a cooperation framework uh, in the third party markets in the Middle East. And the other one is a dialogue platform for these new actors on the Middle East security issues. Uh, and I think these new actors have the ability and responsibility to contribute to the peace in this region. And the Chinese foreign minister, uh, foreign minister Wang Yi proposed uh, for many times that a dialogue platform in the Gulf region should be established. I think the, this platform should include these new actors. Finally, I, I must say that although the possibility is very low, I think these new actors must work hard to promote cooperation in the Middle East. Uh, of course, the urgency for cooperation is not in these Gulf uh, uh, rich countries, but in poor and fragile countries in the Middle East. Uh, we have seen that uh, in some countries, such as Lebanon and uh, Tunisia, uh, the situation is very bad and uh, terrorism has also began to recover. If these fragile countries cannot be helped, and we, cannot, uh, and we cannot jointly deal with the threat of terrorism, no one will be a winner in the Middle East and uh, all will be a loser. Uh, therefore, uh, the concept of community with a shared future proposed by China, I think is worthy of reference. In the post epidemic era, uh, we need to adhere to the concept of community rather than the traditional concept of big power competition. I think uh, it is vital to the economic recovery in the post epidemic era and uh, to the future of the Middle East. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Jin <clears throat> uh, for uh, offering, uh, I think, a little bit different picture of the, what is going on in the Middle East and the, and the concept of the multipolarization in two levels within the region and within the Asian power in the region. I think there, there would be some question regarding these presentations. Uh, now we <clears throat> move toward uh, Professor Salouk uh, Kala Gulu, the Director of Globalization and Development Program, Division of Humanities and Social Sciences, Beijing Normal University. Professor, do you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I, yeah, okay. yes, I can. Please take yeah, the floor. Uh, uh, let me make a small correction. I am not the director uh, of the program. I'm uh, a faculty in the program, uh, so of the uh, United International College in China. Uh, also today, uh, I want to focus on uh, some leading Asian powers because there are many uh, emerging uh, economies or powers in Asia, in Southeast Asia and in Northeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, so in, in that means, uh, East Asia or in the in the Pacific countries or Asia Pacific countries, uh, but previous speakers also touch upon some points uh, for that, basically regarding uh, Japan, uh, India, and South Korea. 
so uh, I will also uh, take a look for these three leading uh, Asian economies in the Middle East. The, uh, the, the biggest economy uh, in the region, of course, in the Middle East, in the MENA region, is China, but the next session will cover uh, China separately. That's why I just focused on Japan, uh, India, and South Korea. Uh, uh, Japan, uh, when we look at Japan, Japan is the, the oldest power in the region uh, after developing very fast in the, uh, in the Cold War period. Uh, so Japan has become uh, economically dominant in the region during the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, until today. Uh, so Japan uh, usually has a very balanced policy uh, in the Middle East and keeping politically neutral uh, in differences in the Arab-Israeli conflict or the other regional conflicts. And uh, since uh, the early uh, 1980s, uh, during the Iran-Iraq war and uh, the Gulf War and the rivalry between Iran and uh, the Arab Gulf countries, usually uh, Tokyo has a, a policy of neutrality. Uh, the, 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 this is one of the main pillar of the Japanese foreign policy in general. Uh, on the other, there is a dependency, uh, for energy dependence of Japan to the, uh, to the Gulf region. So the, all these countries are very important. And also these countries are important uh, markets uh, for Japan. Uh, in that regard, Japan has some constraints and also some economic capacities. Uh, but in the last uh, two decades, Japan uh, also tried to adopt more uh, 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 its own policy in the region uh, with some concerns. One is the rising China, uh, also in the Middle East uh, region, uh, is a concern for, uh, for Japan try to keep a balance uh, for uh, increasing uh, Chinese influence over the Gulf region, uh, particularly. Uh, and also uh, there are some uh, economic competence in some other countries, basically in Iran uh, and also in Turkey uh, in that regard. Uh, but uh, Japanese constraint uh, also uh, Japan needs to respect the uh, U.S. foreign policy in the region. So then uh, Japan has no capacity to develop a very different policy from Washington in that regard and needs to pay attention for this, these policies. Uh, but uh, when we look at Japan, the, there is an increasing uh, consistency in the region, but uh, try to keep its uh, dominance or importance for the region and basically uh, uh, competing with other uh, powers, basically economically, China, South Korea, uh, and India, and others. Uh, when we look at, also, uh, the, regarding Japan, uh, uh, Japan, uh, during the Abe period uh, recently, uh, Japan uh, tried to develop a strategic cooperation with Turkey in the region, but this uh, purpose uh, did not carry out uh, fully because uh, Turkey involved uh, very deep in some uh, regional uh, uh, conflicts and disputes in recent years. So uh, this made Japan hesitant to act together with Turkey uh, in the case of uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, Libya, and others. Uh, but on the other, uh, they, uh, there is an increasing cooperation and economic partnership uh, during the other period uh, between uh, Turkey and uh, Japan. Uh, India is also another emerging power. Uh, for in, in Indian perspective, uh, also there is an energy, an energy dependency uh, economically, and also India considers the Middle East as a large market. And also in the Gulf Arab countries, uh, there are uh, huge numbers of, uh, huge number of uh, migrant workers uh, uh, for, of India. So India needs to keep its economic interests. Uh, the, the other uh, objective of India to keep a balance basically against China uh, and uh, Pakistan also, uh, and also keeping good relationship uh, Muslim dominant countries in the region uh, and strategically developing an uh, alternative roads 
So the Medinas and Central Asia uh, and Afghanistan uh, before the Taliban era. Uh, so in that regard, Iran is very important uh, for, uh, for, uh, for India, uh, building an alternative road to the Belt Road Initiative to Central Asia, to other uh, parts of the Eurasia and M Middle East also. Uh, but also there are some uh, these uh, difficulties uh, in that regard. Uh, in uh, regarding the regional integration project uh, perspectives and projects and initiatives, Iran is the epicenter of the uh, Chinese Belt Road initiatives and Indian uh, regional initiatives in that regard. There are uh, some delicate balances, but uh, basically when the Trump administration initiated uh, new sanctions to Iran, uh, this uh, has caused some delay of some uh, Indian investment in Iran, uh, or uh, there, were, uh, there, there were some uh, setbacks for the Indian uh, Iranian uh, economic and regional cooperation or infrastructure cooperation, basically. Uh, and uh, since early 2019, uh, depending on developing uh, Turkey-Pakistan economic uh, and strategic, basically strategic and military uh, cooperation. Uh, India has more concern for that and also keeping a balance uh, against Pakistan has become important, uh, not only in Afghanistan uh, before the Taliban takeover, but also in other uh, parts of the Middle East and countries. So developing different uh, perspectives and uh, focuses for that. Uh, during the Cold War, Iran uh, was very pro-Arab uh, but uh, currently, Iran has, has uh, sorry, India has developed very uh, close uh, partnership with Israel. But thanks to developing Gulf Arab countries and Israel relations, this has become not a problem uh, in, in that regard. When we look at South Korea, South Korea is a middle power. When, uh, it is different than uh, Japan and India and China. Uh, South Korea basically has an economic agenda in the region and considering the region as a uh, market and also exporting some high-tech materials, including um, high-tech goods, uh, technology, and other uh, capacities, including nuclear energy. Uh, in that regard, the developing cooperation between uh, South Korea, energy co nuclear energy cooperation between South Korea and the UAE is very important. Uh, uh, but uh, in economic competition, South Korea is very tough, basically competing with uh, Japan and uh, China in the region, but without uh, a political ba uh, baggage, without a political difficulty, and without a, uh, a, without attracting any uh, competence, political competence with any power. So South Korea has become more uh, uh, more confident and more uh, uh, unrestricted power in the region. And also, South Korea is enjoying its uh, soft power influence, basically, with the help of the Korean cultural products uh, in the region. Uh, but of course, South Korea, uh, some for economic reasons and some political reasons, some uh, uh, restrictions uh, and constraints. Uh, but uh, like Japan, South Korea is also playing a neutral, active neutral, political neutrality in the uh, region and staying uh, neutral and not involve direct conflicts and confrontations in the region as much as uh, possible. Uh, so in that regard, we can see more Asian involvement in the region uh, and basically economically, uh, the MENA region is very needed for Asian powers, for infrastructure development, for rebuilding of countries, uh, basically in the uh, war-torn countries, if there is a uh, peace process and stability in the region, like uh, uh, Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya, and Yemen. Uh, so uh, in coming years, we will see more uh, Asian uh, powers involvement and also competition also. Uh, in that regard, uh, the MENA uh, Asia relationship or Asian countries relationship will increase uh, after time being. So I, I want to stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Kalagolu, for this uh, for the amazing presentation, especially the 
your approach toward the different roles that the Asian powers would have to take in the Middle East. It was very interesting. Uh, and the, your, your approach that they would have a dumb, they would have very important role, but a different role in the Middle East. Thank you. Now the time is for the Professor Ekaterina Matoy, uh, Program Director at MEPI, Lecturer at the Islamic uh, and Middle Eastern Studies Department of Basel University, Switzerland. Professor, do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Please take the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, please allow me to start by wishing happy birthday to the United Arab Emirates for its 50th birthday. You know, United Arab Emirates is an important play player in MENA region and even an important, a more important one after the signing of the Abraham Accords. It's my honor to address you on the already classical topic of developments in MENA and AFPAC as well. This region, never cease to surprise us, to surprise us, and according to nowadays prospects, remain an important space in which power projection will lead to new alliances and new divisions. Therefore, my today's speech is concentrated around general backgrounds, new actors or state or non-state actors, new roles perhaps for some states and less on new instruments or means of pressure or potential new borders in uh, the MENA region. Ladies and gentlemen, today's background on a global scale is not only different than 20 years ago when the war on terror was initiated, but accelerated and probably less predictable on long term. The classical global security paradigm in which the United States and its allies dominated the planet it's, is increasingly questioned directly and indirectly. Projects like One Belt, One Road took the world by surprise somehow. Turkey's rise as well at the regional level raised question on possible outcomes and Israel's recent MENA policy resembles to at least a partial substantiation of United States influence in the region. The failure of the Western Alliance to achieve a quick and result military and political success in Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria empowered reactionary actors and fueled instability associated to post-conflict periods. Climate change and obvious tendencies of some state or non-state actors to actually monetize on the new goals rather than the addressing them. The ongoing pandemic and the associated economic and social problems, the weaponization of mass media and the online environment, a space race that has military and strategic components, diminished altogether the amount of political capital required to reshape a better home planet for all of us. On this note, the generalization of sanctions or trade tariffs not only between opponents, but also between traditional allies like Europe and the United States undermine dialogue and the chances of diplomacy to achieve resounding breakthroughs. If we took one of the most recent examples, that of Lebanon, the effects of sanctions in a time of crisis go well beyond pressuring the governments, the government to correct paths and affect livelihoods of individuals that do not have a second choice. Therefore, my first message to you today is related to sanctions. If one has, if one was able to distinguish between good and bad sanctions in humanity, humanity's recent history, please assess continuously the employment of this easy to use instrument that can have a significant impact on long term. While China appears to go against all Western powers with few exceptions related to Taiwan as one China policy resembles an instrument of the past nowadays odd expressions of public-private partnership like the ones between NASA and SpaceX raise eyebrows and have the potential to confuse. The recent breakthroughs of Citigroup, GP Morgan Chase, and Goldman Sachs in China, along the recent apology of GP Morgan CEO on comments related to China's Communist Party, instantiate a new paradigm. Who would have thought 50 years ago that the world's largest liberal economy will work so closely, so differently to world largest communist economy? The latest DOD, ladies and gentlemen, global posture review indicates an hybrid American approach to China's rise with a military component positioned at first sight, diametrically opposed to the business component, reinforcing the Indo-Pacific region militarily, which has become a US priority implies the European partners to start countering Russia Federation. 
more actively and reduction of troops in the Middle East plus relocation of the Fifth Fleet to Oman. When assessing such a development, one needs to consider that the United States military is only one of the power projection tools in foreign policy, and this is relatively well integrated in a broader strategic approach. This intervention will certainly not answer the previous questions, but one cannot overlook the emergence of actors other than states in MENA, AFPAC, and the Horn of Africa. Starting from the, from the East movements like Tehrek, Labaik, Pakistan, pressed the Pakistani government into agreements while using force. The so-called Islamic State, with K or without K, letter, whose rise and fall still appears to be in a mist after so many years, claims stop attacks in a Taliban-led Afghanistan for whose attention many powerhouses compete now. If you're not, if you haven't heard about of AANES, the acronym stands for Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria. This entity is asking for international recognition and lobbies the United States to exclude it from the sanctions regime applied to Syria. While the mainstream media lost appetite for new names of extremist organization from Syria, probably due to the fact that there were too many and the path of the conflict is now more or less established, Hezbollah did not lose any war and did not win any so far. The deterioration, the, the deterioration of people's lives in Lebanon, the Israeli attacks on Syria from Lebanon's airspace demonstrate that there is much to be done in the future. As a parenthesis, it is also not worth nothing, noting that activism is also taking unthinkable shapes. Recent news revealed that the group Turkish Democracy Project based in the United States and led by Mark Wallace failed to rally any Turkish person in its management board eventually. On the African continent, let's go to the Horn of Africa, the developments outline other questionable non-state actors like we know it's not quite a new one, the Tigray People's Liberation Front in Ethiopia. Not to mention also we have numerous factions in Libya, while Somaliland we have, we have another, was Somaliland actually that pushes for international recognition. Before starting the introduction of new roles of state actors in MENA and DAFPAC region, I would like to state my second message for today. When politicizing media and all possible collaboration means, one should assume that goal might be met by side, eff side effects may also accompany such decisions. 20 years ago, the United States was the dominant power in the region and had thriving relations with Turkey, its NATO partner and second largest army from the organization and the Arab countries. Nowadays, the relation with Turkey are under immense pressure, sanctions and exclusion from the F-35 program being landmarks of the relation. Since the Persian Gulf countries developed their hydrocarbon exports to Asia, United States strategic relation was maintained especially through arms sales but the Abraham Accords appear to shift the interest of Persian Gulf countries towards Israel and emerging arms suppliers, not only for the region, including Morocco, but for the global market. Sanctions and the threat of further sanctions brought Turkey closer to Iran and both closer to the Russian Federation China in the past 20 years. While the security landscape in conflict or former conflict regions like Libya, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan is marked by state actors like militaries, but also both private military companies or PSCs, shortly mercenaries, from the United States, Russian Federation, etc. The recent retreat of the United States from Afghanistan made the headlines around the world. Taking into consideration the 2011 completion of withdrawal from Iraq, one can ask himself what the withdrawal implies and whether media reports exaggerated the presentation of Afghanistan situation. Did the United States really leave Afghanistan for good or there is more to come? There are many NGOs, companies, institutions that can eventually compensate armies withdrawal from a foreign country. You know, ladies and gentlemen, for some country, war and conflicts means business. As the rule applies further, this major development was accompanied by sanctions, while China and the Russian Federation took slow and generally calculated steps in MENA. An obvious interest of China and Afghanistan and Pakistan drives increased collaboration with these two neighboring countries. As the relocation of British troops from Canada to Oman, indicate United Kingdom's willingness to be closer to Suez Canal, a classical move for the former colonial empire. The Abraham Accords are presented as the most significant game changer in the region. A few words about Abraham Accords and eventually the conclusion, if I may. Um, unlike Sudan, which was initially interested in the plan and then stepped back, and Egypt, which apparently maintains a cold silence, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco increased cooperation in multiple fields. The security interests for Israel vis-a-vis -vis Iran 
met with oil interest of Abu Dhabi, which is apparently projecting to export oil through two ports and a pipeline in Israel that circumvents the Suez Canal. The United Arab Emirates appears to be an ambassador of the accords in the region with important interests related to this agreement. But the major question related to the further developments is how much further can the Israel United Arab Emirates relations be developed? While the text from the accord signed in Washington appears to contain ideas from Theodor Herzl's Alt Neue Land, of course, a, an utopian novel written on more than 100 years ago, some countries like Algeria, Iran, and groups from Pakistan clearly underline their support for the Palestinian cause. This does not imply that United Arab Emirates is not, but the stances are on the matter obviously not similar. While the declared goal of the accords for the United Arab Emirates was the suspension of annexation plans in occupied Palestinian territories, two important aspects become apparent. Annexation plan appeared to continue and Saudi Arabia has not joined the accords yet. However, the diplomatic rift between KSAU, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain on one side, and Lebanon on the other side is clearly advantaging Israel in its military dispute and maritime border dispute with Lebanon. The hydrocarbon resources from the Eastern Mediterranean do not only strengthen Israel and its partners from the accords and the bypass the Suez, but will also challenge Turkey's plan to become a natural gas hub for Europe. And a few conclusion, or instead of conclusion, if I may, it can be concluded that the- Sorry for uh, just one minute, sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it can be concluded that the dynamics from MENA and AFPAC region are significant, but whether Israel has the potential to replace United States influence and arms supplies in the region cannot be answered at this time. The 20, uh, 2021 Global Posture Review matches that hypothesis the hypothesis that the United States will shift resources away from the Middle East, increase the odds for other actors to exert more influence, but a systematic pass of the baton is not clearly confirmed yet and requires further research. Similarly, if United Arab Emirates, United Arab Emirates actions will manage to bring a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or not, as aimed initially, cannot be estimated with acceptable precision at the moment. What has become clear is that Lebanon's trouble will probably not end soon and easy since the stakes in the region rise by the day. Um, with respect to the significant rise of the non-state actors' roles and actions within state borders or internationally, the regulation gap has already become visible. It will probably be addressed more in the decades to come in matters of both phys physical and cyber aggression, keeping in mind the recent case of NSO company. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Please proceed with question and let us debate further till the end of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, since we don't have any, any time without any comment, we go to Dr. Mohammad Taymur Fahad Khan, Research Associate, the Institute of Strategic Studies, ISSI, Islamabad, Islamabad Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Uh, since you are the last one, and since we don't have any time, and we have crossed the limitation from this point, please, I ask you to present your remarks in eight or two, ten minutes, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, Mr. Dowd, can you hear me? Yes, 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 I can. Please, go ahead. Great, great. Uh, so, uh, Honorable Chair, Excellencies, colleagues, and dear participants, Assalamu alaikum, hello and good evening as it is evening in Pakistan now. First of all, I would like to begin by stating that what an honor it is to be part of this international conference that has gathered today a galaxy of eminent experts, policy makers, academics and scholars to discuss and opinion on issues of great significance to all of our respective countries. One advantage of speaking at the end is that most of the things are already covered by the preceding panelists in an elaborate manner, which is why I will keep my remarks short and make the best of the time that is, has been allotted to me. Now, the importance of Middle East is not lost on us. Historically, strategically, economically, Middle East has remained one of the most important regions in the world. As mentioned by Dr. Jaffer, historically, Middle East is the birthplace of three great Abrahamic religions and home to some of the world's earliest civilizations. Strategically, Middle East is a natural continental bridge that connects Asia, Africa, and Europe. Economically, as you must all be aware, Middle East is one of the world's largest wealth-generating regions in the world with effective labor utilization and natural non-renewable resources. Having such a diverse social, strategic, and political-economic landscape, the Middle East region has remained in the focus of many regional and external regional powers that tend to have major stakes, conflicting and otherwise, in the region. This in turn led to a perpetual power play in the Middle East, and because of that, among other reasons, most of its history, at least its modern history, 
Middle East has been besieged by international conflicts. Be it the European powers' competition to colonize its territories in the early 19th century, the Gulf War, or the uh, war on terror post 9-11, the 2010 Arab Spring uprisings, or the regional conflicts in contemporary times in countries like Palestine, Yemen, Iraq, and Syria, to name a few. However, as the world is undergoing a paradigm shift with great political tectonic movements underway, the Middle East is also undergoing a geostrategic and economic transformation. New actors are emerging with increasing and different stakes and roles in the region. Although geostrategy will always remain an integral component in policy making of any country or region for that matter, but the focus in the Middle East is now shifting to geoeconomics which probably stems out of the realization by the regional countries that the sustainability, security, stability and progress of the region is dependent upon regional cohesion and economic interdependency. Consequences of the conflict in the Middle East, emergence of a multipolar world order and the rise of regionalism as an antithesis to globalism combined with the unfolding of events after the ascendance of Mr. Trump as the US President has had a transforming impact on the thinking of the leadership in the Middle Eastern countries. Traditionally, Middle East has remained the area of influence of Western powers where different countries remain influential during different times. But now new actors have emerged, especially from Asia, particularly China. The emergence of these new actors had a profound effect on Middle East's regional dynamics which has resulted in numerous significant economic, political and social reforms, opening up new vistas of cooperation for the region with the emerging actors in the Middle East. In my humble observation, the new actors in the Middle East are showing keen interest in what the region has to offer. To someone who casually looks at the region, most of the Middle East except a few states in the region uh, see it as a region in turmoil with grave systemic problems. The image is further worsened by how media presents it as well. But if one looks closely, Middle East offers great opportunities and potentials for positive social impact. The region is vast and complex and there is need for properly understanding the different nations and peoples inhabited in the Middle East. The emergence of new actors in the Middle East is majorly a result of the disengagement or distancing of the US for the latter's own reasons and policy interests. This dis distancing at a time when Middle East is at the cusp of significant transformation left a vacuum which needed to be filled. Recent developments in the region has caused its leadership to consider and take bold transformational action to redefine and diversify their economies and emerging actors like the Asian countries, mainly China and Japan, are capitalizing on the significant strategic opportunity by engaging with the region through, its, through their huge investments and development projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative to name one. The presence of new actors in the Middle East, especially countries like China, Singapore, Japan, India and others, is not without good reasons. As mentioned earlier, the region has a lot to offer, such as the potential to rival any other significant region as a marketplace for goods and services, its role in keeping energy prices stable and affordable in order to keep their manufacturing costs at the minimum, the transit, all the while ensuring a reliable energy stream for their industries as well as maintaining national and regional security complemented by economic prosperity. In conclusion, I'll say that by changing the terms of engagement with the Middle East and prioritizing investment in the economic and human prosperity in the region, emerging actors are looking at better serving their interests. Thanks to the COVID pandemic, states and regions around the world have been provided with a unique opportunity to take unprecedented actions to build more dynamic and agile economies, and countries of the Middle East are making good use of this opportunity. In partnership with emerging actors, the Middle Eastern countries along with emerging actors yeah, is looking to shape a better future for the region and its people by focusing on economic interdependency and cooperation, which will not only help in regional cohesion, but will help in eliminating incentives for conflict as well. But again, Middle East has to remain, uh, Middle East still has to maintain a very delicate balance because again, stakes by several countries, however different in nature, are still at play in the region among players that continue to have opposing or conflicting interests with each other. For example, such as China and India, Japan and China, and as mentioned by Professor Silju, Pakistan and India as well. This situation, if not handled amicably, can lead to the region becoming a battlefield for interests once again. With this, I would like to thank the organizers of this international conference, the MEPEI, Euro Defense Romania and IPIS Tehran for holding this conference and for giving me the opportunity to present my views at this esteemed forum. Thank you.